We'll begin with the recitation of Psalm 23. Adonai roi lo echsar Bino teshe yarvitseni Al mei menuchot, al mei menuchot Yena haleini Nafshi yeshovev, yeshovev Yanchini v'maglei tzedek Yanchini v'maglei tzedek Leman shemo Gam ki elech Megeitz al mavet Lo irara ki ata imadi Shiftecha umishantecha Heima heima yena chamuni Taruch lefanai lefanai Shulchan neged zorerai Dishan tava shemen roshi Kosi revaya Hatova chesen yirdefuni Kol yemei chayai Veshavti bevet Adonai Leorech yamin Adonai rohi lo echsar A psalm of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside the still waters. The Holy One restores my soul and guides me in straight paths, for that is God's name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As we gather here today to accompany our beloved Robert Schubach to his final resting place, we're reminded that there are many pressures involved in living, and sometimes there are even greater pressures involved in dying. The responsibility of caregiving is all-consuming and exhausting. For the caregiver to crave relief is a longing as ancient as the book of Psalms itself. And so we read, From the end of the earth I call to you, when my heart is faint, you lead me to a rock that is high above me. The Omar mi ten li ever kayona a ufa ve eshkona. Hine archik ne dod alin bamid bar sela. Achisha mi flatli me ruach so ami saar. I said, Oh, that I had wings of a dove, I would fly away and find rest. Lo, I would flee far off. I would lodge in the wilderness. I would soon find a refuge from the sweeping wind from the tempest. The sweeping tempest has blown its last. The tempest is no more. Now is a time for refuge and solace, for lodging in the wilderness. 
For those of us blessed with having witnessed the care that one human being can show another, we know that wilderness does not last forever. Pain and sorrow may challenge our faith, but the courage to persevere in the face of adversity is a miracle. As long as there is compassion in the human heart and the will to act on a virtue both human and divine, there is reason to believe. Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, who passed away just the Shabbat before last, once wrote that acts of kindness never die. They live in the memory, giving life to other acts in return. Surely the Mishnaic edict, mitzvah goreret mitzvah, or the fulfillment of one commandment leads to another, rang in the rabbi's head as he wrote these words. This is the legacy of Robert Schubach, Moshe ben Gedalia. The common thread among the outpouring of loving responses to his passing was his kindness. It is particularly heartbreaking to lose Bob and his overwhelming kindness at a time when our world needs it most. Let this be the lesson we learn today. As we remember Bob, may we be inspired to give life to other acts of kindness in his memory. In Bob's 87 years, he saw the world at its darkest and at its brightest, yet he chose the light of kindness to be his path. Robert Schubach entered this world on August 8, 1933. He was born in a small village in southwestern Germany. There he lived with his parents, Gustav and Pauline, and his younger sister, Inga. Just last week, the world marked 82 years since Kristallnacht. Bob was only five years old at that time. The Schubachs were the only Jewish family in their town. Having kept exact records of Jewish residences, the Nazis knew exactly where to find them. Two men entered the Schubach home that evening and smashed a cabinet, shattering jars of jams and jellies, as well as medicines all over the floor. In his five-year-old fury, Bob ran to one of the Nazis and bit him in the leg. The Nazi pulled out his gun and held it against young Bob's head. Instantly, his mother pushed her way between the Nazi and her son. The Nazi understood that this woman was not to be messed with and holstered his firearm. That evening, Bob's father was taken to Dachau, where he spent nearly two months. Bob's mother, once again an incredible, amazing woman, was able to get her husband out of the camp by arguing with the SS that he had earned many medals in World War I. When Gustav returned home, weighing only 80 pounds, his own parents did not recognize him. It was Bob who lit up and ran to his father, shouting, Papa, Papa. Much to the credit of Bob's impressive mother, the family made their way to the United States a few months later. It was March of 1939. Pauline could not convince her parents to leave with them. She tried to save them from afar, to bring them to the United States, but she was unable. Life was very different for young Robert. At five years old, he was biting Nazis in the leg. But when he started ki a kindergarten at Coventry Elementary, a crossing guard approached Bob and his mother helped, excuse me, approached Bob and his mother and helped young Bob cross the street. The two of them were overwhelmed with emotion. This uniform crossing guard appeared the same as the bad guys they knew in Germany, but he helped Bob cross the street with such love and care. Surely their life in the United States would be different. And different it was. The family was quite poor as they had left most of what they had amassed behind in Germany. However, they did what they had to do to build a new life in the United States. They took in boarders with whom Bob often shared a room. One of their boarders helped young Bob enter a contest through the local paper to become a bat boy for the Indians. Bob got to the finals and found himself a young immigrant sitting at a table with a group of businessmen. One of the men asked Bob what his father did for a living. Though Gustav was an engineer in Germany, he was a simple factory worker in the United States. 
Bob felt discriminated against as an immigrant and thought perhaps this was why he wasn't given the opportunity. Though this did not ruin the Indians for him, he remained a loyal fan throughout his lifetime. But eventually, Bob figured out how to work the system a little bit. In high school, he was forced to take a foreign language. They didn't know that his first language was German, so he enrolled in a German class. And everything went well until he started using some words that the teacher hadn't exactly taught him. Why, Robert, what a feel you have for the language, his teacher told him. He even told his mother that she was not allowed to speak at parent-teacher conferences as not to give him away with her heavy German accent. In those days, one could work hard and save enough money to go to college. This is exactly what Bob did. He had a paper route and other odd jobs and eventually saved enough to attend and graduate from Case with a degree in electrical engineering. After this, Bob went to night school at John Carroll to get a master's degree in physics. Alice told me a story not too long ago from this period in Bob's life that highlights the ways that Bob built his life upon kindness. He worked for much of his career at a small company as part of their electrical engineering team. It was a decent job and he was respected, but the chances for advancement were, were limited. Eventually he moved on to another company where he was promoted to chief electrical engineer and he worked there until his retirement. Bob encouraged two of his friends from the first company to change jobs and work for him. And for one friend, it worked out very well. He worked there, excuse me, for one friend it worked out very well, but for the other friend, not so much. As it turned out, this friend's skills did not translate very well to the new environment. His friend was a competent engineer, but panicked at deadlines. Whenever he was assigned a project, he would make progress for a while. But then as the deadline grew closer, he would freeze. He just couldn't get the work done. Bob's friend was in serious trouble. One day, not surprisingly, Bob was called into the office of the higher ups. He was told, we're sorry, but we'll have to fire your friend. Bob made his case for keeping his friend on. Please don't fire him. I will personally take responsibility for all of his deadlines going forward. Management reluctantly agreed, giving him a chance to fulfill that promise, and he did. For years, until his friend voluntarily retired, Bob put in free overtime on weekends, as needed, to fulfill the promise and save his friend's job. This was not a short-term commitment. This covered a span of about 30 years. And in all that time, he never showed any annoyance or resentment. He just did the extra work. As Alice said to me, this is the essential Bob Schubach, one of many stories that define who he was. With such a strong sense of kindness and commitment, it's no wonder that Alice fell in love with him. The two of them crossed paths at a New Year's Eve party in 1959. Alice may have been at this party initially with someone else, but it wasn't all too serious. And Bob set his sights on her, and he never looked away. He called Alice after that party. With great persistence, he set up their first date. Bob was 26 years old, and Alice only 17. The pair dated for three years prior to their wedding on August 18, 1963. They were married at the Mayfield Temple by our beloved Rabbi Jacob Stuhl of blessed memory. And then in 1968, Laura joined the family and Bernard in 1970. It was a fun home. Bob was an involved father, considering many other fathers at the time. He was the primary breadwinner for their childhood, but he was committed to spending his evenings with his children. He was there for bath time and told them stories with his signature silly voices. Bob liked to plan the family vacations. Plan is maybe a little bit of an overstatement. He liked to go on the vacations, but planned as little as possible. For example, when the family visited Israel in 1984, they only had plans for where they would stay the first night. All of this was part of the adventure. Not knowing what came next never bothered Bob. He still made it to the Western Wall, a highlight of that trip for him. 
He stood there in a red shirt and plaid shorts, happy as punch to be there and without a care in the world, as his colorful ensemble broke through the sea of men around him, dressed only in black and white. Not to pick on Bob, but his children remarked that that outfit wasn't exactly contemporary in the 80s. And my guess is that many of us probably know exactly what plaid shorts and red shirt that, uh, that we're talking about in this picture. Bob loved gardening. When the kids were grown, he insisted that he and Alice move to a house with a yard and not a condo so that he could continue to garden. He had a horseradish plant that he would dig up every year for Passover, wonderful and abundant tomatoes and a variety of berries. He would engineer large structures around his plants to protect them and make room for them to grow. Bob loved taking pictures and sometimes this drove his family crazy. They would be looking at something else or mid-chew, and he would insist they turn around and smile for a picture. Bob loved swimming. He would take his parents and his children to the beach on weekends and loved being in the water. Not only was he a devoted father, but also a devoted son. When Bob's father was sick and bedridden, Bob would go over every night to help his mother take care of his father. And after his father passed, Bob would call his mother every single day for years until she passed. Of course, Bob was also a devoted husband. He loved Alice with everything he had. The pair would often be seen walking hand in hand or sitting next to each other so close that they may have well have been snuggling. Bob loved Alice with everything he had to the very end. And likewise, Alice, you did everything you could do and beyond everything you could do to care for him and to preserve his dignity as long as you could. Your 57 years of marriage is an example for all of us. And recently you mentioned to me that a neighbor commented that Bob's example inspired him to strive to always be the best husband and father he could be. Bob loved his four grandchildren, Alan, Joel, Danny, and Abby. He read to them, cooked for them, and each of them have their own versions of his stories and warm memories of his love and kindness. For me personally, it was, honor to be, it was an honor to be Bob's rabbi for the final years of his life. Though the effects of his dementia became clearer and clearer over that time, my memories of Bob are also of his kindness, his smile, his gentleness, and his joy. Bob and Alice were regular shul goers, especially on Friday nights. After services for many months, years perhaps even, Bob would take me over to the portrait of our shul's first spiritual leader, Dr. Manfred Strauss. He would proudly point to the picture and say, this is my uncle Manfred. Each week I would smile and thank him for sharing. His enthusiasm and his desire to connect me to his past and to our shul's past shined through his illness. Likewise, Bob and Alice attended almost every single class that I taught at Shul, and I loved having Bob in class. He was just happy to be there, seemed overjoyed all the time. He sat exuding kindness and light as he nodded his head and smiled at every word that I said. Once again, there was something so innately kind about him that remained despite his illness. As it was for his entire life, Bob chose love, light, and kindness over all else. As Rabbi Sachs taught, acts of kindness never die. They linger in the memory, giving life to other acts in return. And so we pray, may the memory of Robert Schubach and his endless loving kindness continue to inspire us. For as long as we follow on the path of kindness, we allow his soul to be bound up with our own, giving him eternal life. As long as we remain courageous, thoughtful, adventurous, creative, loving, kind, and resilient, so too will he remain alive in our hearts and memories. May the memory of Robert Schubach, Moshe ben Gedalia, bring blessing to our world and to all who are fortunate enough to know him. And we say, Amen. It's my honor now to invite Alice to 
come on up and share some words and reflections. Over the last, um, what is it, two days, two or three days, I've received lots and lots of warm messages, Facebook messages and text messages and emails and so on and so forth. And as the rabbi just pointed out, the recurring theme of the seemed to be of his kindness and his cheerfulness. And you know, it reminded me that really is why I loved him. That really, that really is. Now, and, and the rabbi mentioned the um, comment from the former neighbor, but I actually brought that to read a little bit of it. So, uh, uh, it has been our honor to have known you and Bob for the last 10 years. His gentle way and kind smile will never be forgotten by Monique. Monique, myself, or the kids. His willingness to always walk hand in hand with you is something that has inspired me to be the best husband and father I can, and I will always have fond memories of him. I pray that God gives you and your family the strength needed to endure this difficult time and continue your journey. Knowing in your hearts that Bob will forever be with you and all of us in spirit, he was certainly one in a million. And I mean, he was one in a million, and I had used that phrase by coincidence the day before to somebody else, somebody that happened to not know him, and I met after he after he was in the home. The um, uh, two other things I wanted to share when I, when I moved, I went through all my papers and I had to get rid of. I, they threw away all sorts of stuff, but two specific things that I brought here to share, I, I kept because I thought they were very meaningful. And they, the um, he he wrote a memo which I found I um I found, and it says. Uh, in May, in May 2007, this is Bob speaking to a co no, to uh, whoever he was talking to. He, he said, in May 2007, I received a copy of the following newspaper clipping from a coworker in the Des Moines office of my employer, preceded by the comment, "What do you think?" And not to read every word because it would be too long, but there were three tragedies, three tragedies in which somebody was killed by an ungrounded manhole cover, and so he he. He, he was being asked, what do you think? What can we do about this? And so he consulted. He said, my first step after reading the article was to contact a major manufacturer of manhole covers. And they consulted. And they found a technical solution. I didn't even know about this until I found this memo. But they found a technical solution. And then he says, I then contacted the number two manhole manufacturer, who readily agreed to follow suit by incorporating the grounding provisions on their product. My next step presently in process is to incorporate the requirement for grounding of manhole rims and covers in the National Electrical Code. So presumably he saved lives by making this, this, uh, this technical change, which, as I say, I didn't even know about it, but that's pretty impressive. And the one other thing I want to share with you that I also found in clean, Cleaning House is from his cousin who died many years ago. But this cousin uh, wrote, he, he wrote about a small inheritance that was left by, by his aunt. And it says, um, I, I'm pleased to tell you that my mother left you a small inheritance in appreciation of the attention you paid her. And see, that fits the theme. And the many things you did for her, particularly after dad died. She spoke of you often, saying she could always depend on you when something needed doing. In German, she said, uh, Robert kann alles. Robert can do everything. And then, you know, then they go on a little bit uh, with things that are relevant to. But again, it shows not only his kindness, but he was a fixer. He wanted to make the world better in any way that he could. Uh, so he was a fixer in his work and family. He sincerely wanted to leave the world a better place. And I believe that he succeeded in that. And that's all. Uh, thank you, Rabbi. Today I want to share with you a few life lessons that I learned from my father. The first one is love your work. My father worked very hard to support his family and received high respect and recognition for his meticulous electrical engineering work, but he also really loved his work and was especially proud of the times when he was able to use his creativity on the job. He had designed several electrical substations in the Cleveland area and often on family car rides when we passed one of his substations, he would point it out and tell us that he had used his creativity to lay out the substation such as in the shape of the letter H. 
Each spring, he planted a garden in our yard and took great pride in the structures that he would build to support his tomatoes and pole beans, often using recycled materials such as old mop poles and curtain rods that he found on tree lawns. He also placed a, a high value on education. While working full time, he went to night school to earn his master's degree in physics. And in my senior year of college, he strongly encouraged me to continue my education for a master's degree. He always had the highest expectations for his children. He once wrote me a letter, including a quote from the Wheel of Fortune, don't sell yourself short. And then he made a, a pun about me being short. <laughs> <laughs> Number two is love your family. My father was a devoted son, brother, uncle, husband, father, and grandfather. When my brother and I were little, he often took responsibility for our bedtime routine. He loved to make fruit salad, and on the weekends, he often cooked sunny side up eggs for us and used his treasured mandolin to cut waffle fries, which he would then deep fry. I also suspect that he may have been the tooth fairy. <laughs> my mother stayed at home with me and my brother for many years, but my father couldn't have been more proud when she went back to college and then took a job as a computer analyst when we were teenagers. My father wore his heart on his sleeve. At my middle school band concerts, he was always the one standing up and waving his hand wildly in the back of the auditorium as my mother tried to restrain him. <laughs> he always ate my cooking experiments enthusiastically and said that it was the best thing he'd ever had. He loved his family unconditionally and we in turn loved him back. Number three is love of life. My father had a love of adventure and a great sense of humor. When he traveled for work and there was a minor problem, that would become the basis for a humorous story. If he had to wait a long time at the bank, he could make an amusing anecdote out of it. His grandchildren loved to hear when he recounted his childhood misadventures, such as the time he went outside to play when they first arrived in this country and learned his first words of English from the other children. Shut up, dumbbell. <laughs> he also had a great sense of adventure. On family summer vacations, we often set, out, set off without a hotel reservation. Recently, I've heard from some extended family members that our family vacation strategy was somewhat legendary. My father was our fearless leader and usually his sense of direction kept us out of too much trouble, despite the fact that we once had to be escorted out of the Pentagon parking lot in Washington, DC. Many times, my father told us that he would never visit Germany. He didn't believe in spending money in a country that had done so much evil. But when my children, Alan and Joel, were teenagers, we had an opportunity to visit the village and the home where my father and his family had lived. My father agreed to go with us, and my children had the privilege of this shared experience with him. Our hosts were extremely gracious, and true to his optimistic nature, my father said that he was glad he had agreed to go. Despite any setbacks, my father was always the optimist. When we traveled in the car and the weather was overcast, like today, in fact, my mom pointed this out on the car ride over here, she said, one of my father's favorite things to say was, the sky is brighter up ahead. I... Speaking about my father, I tried to come up with just a few short memories of, of him. Starting out, I have very fond memories of Shabbat dinners at Mama and Papa's house, and even I remember with the precious plates that they brought over from Germany and <laughs> I broke one of them but they were very loving and instilled the the importance of Judaism and taking time for that 
And I remember how much he cared for his father, for Papa, when he was dying of Alzheimer's, percussing him, as I think my mother said. And I loved going to the beach with him at Lake Erie and swimming, playing Ring Around the Rosy, and jumping waves when we would go to Ocean City, Maryland, going up and down the strip of hotels looking for a place that had a room and going to Cedar Point and staying at the Breakers and then also going to the beach. And there were two particular vacations that stand out for me, Hawaii and Israel. And I thought it was wonderful that we were able to go to Israel. And I did forgive him for not letting me have a Sabra or a prickly pear on the last day there. <laughs> And seriously, it was an experience that I'll never forget, including that visit to the Western Wall with his famous outfit. And I remember the breakfasts that he would make on the weekends, serving things in margarine bowls, <laughs> convincing me to eat my peas and carrots, and with ding and dong, serving the fruit. And he would use his magic chop chop to make coleslaw and I enjoy gardening with him. And I remember that he always had a really big compost pile in the back of the yard to help nourish the garden, which was ahead of his time that he was really concerned taking care of the earth. And he helped me get through school. And like with Laura, he motivated me to get my master's degree as well as to go to engineering school. And he, he inspired me also. He got a patent, and I also got a patent, and I was thinking of him when I got that, when I did the extra work to get that. And when he visited me as an adult, I remember he always loved our dogs, and he especially liked to read to Abby. And... He loved both of our children. And the one more thing I wanted to say is that even though he never knew our bird, Mango, who we just had a short time, I think Mango had to die just hours before him to pave the way for him to go to heaven. I think there was some connection there. And he will be forever remembered in our hearts as a loving father and also his other relationships to all of everyone else. Thank you. So my grandfather made me the person who I am and the person who he became isn't our control, but what we can control is how we deal with it. And he was very caring and very important to the earth and he was very caring and loving and I love him and I'm happy that he had a good long life and that's who he is. Thank you so much for all of your beautiful words. Bob's children, Laura and Bernie and, and granddaughter, Abby, and of course, Alice for those treasures that you unearthed that really give us a sense of, of who he was on the inside. And, and as I think we all said, as we put it all together, um, I think your words, Alice, are the, are, the, are the most poignant. He was truly one in a million, someone who uh, as our, our sages discussed, toho kevaro, his insides were like his outside. You, the kindness and joy that that uh, that he used to light up every room that he walked into, uh, was really who he was in the very inside. 
and uh, and that is a that is a true a true gift and a true blessing. And uh, if we can achieve those of us here and and those of us who who watch this later who are watching this live now, um, if we can achieve even a, even a portion of that in our lives, we'll be we'll be extremely lucky. That is his memory. That is his legacy. I invite us to rise now as we recite the memorial prayer, asking God to guard that legacy, both for for him as he ascends to worlds beyond ours, but uh, but for those of us who continue to walk this earth as well. Shochen Bamromim Hamsei Menucha Nechona Tachat Kanfei Ashkina Bemalot Kedoshim Torim Kezor Rakia Mazhirim Ed Nishmad Moshe Ben Gedalia Shalach Lolamo Began Eden de Menuchato Ana Balarachamim Astirehu Beseter Knafecha Leolamim Utsror Bitsror Achaim Ed Nishmato Adonai Hu Nachlato Veyanuach Beshalom Al Mishkavo Venomar Amen El Malay Rachamim Exalted, compassionate God, grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and pure to the soul of Robert Schubach, Moshe ben Gedalia, who has gone to his eternal home. Merciful one, we ask that our loved one find perfect peace in your eternal embrace. May his soul be bound up in the bond of life. May he rest in peace. And we say, Amen. Invite us to be seated. In just a few moments, we'll conclude our our service and uh, head over to uh, Zion Memorial Park for uh, for uh, as we accompany Bob to his final resting place. Um, those who have the Zoom link who received that uh, before the service can log on once we get there and hopefully be able to, uh, to participate virtually in that mitzvah. Uh, as you know, Shiva, uh, given the, the state of the world and the state of the pandemic here in Ohio, will be entirely via Zoom. Tonight, Monday and Tuesday evening, we'll start Shiva at 7 p.m. with the recitation of some psalms in the Mourner's Kaddish and then continue sharing memories until about 8.30 each evening. Friends who wish may contribute to the Robert and Alice Schubach Holocaust Educational Fund, care of Congregation Share Tikva, 26811 Fairmount Boulevard in Beechwood, Ohio, 44122, or to the Alzheimer's Association Cleveland Chapter. I invite now our pallbearers to come forward. <clears throat> 